the professionalism, the calmness, uh, the way they went about their business. Uh, there's very few fire departments, I think, in the world that could pull off what, what they did at such a horrible moment with that tragedy. It's just, it's just living proof of what they do from day one in the academy, their heritage, their tradition. Enchanted Sky Media. Media. From the Enchanted Sky Studios in Prescott, Arizona, this is Code 3, the Firefighters Podcast, hosted by award-winning journalist Scott Orr. Code 3 features interviews with leading members of the fire service, discussing firefighting strategies, tactics, and other topics you need to know more about. Now, here's Scott. That's right, and I will not let Parkinson stop me. Thank you for joining me again here on Code 3. You are listening to the show for and about firefighters. Let's get started. On September 11, 2001, our world changed. America was just arriving at work for the day when it heard this. This, Justin, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. Fire Department 408, where's the fire? Yeah, hi. I'm on the 106th floor of the uh, World Trade Center. We just had an explosion up here. Okay, 106th floor. What building are you in, sir? One or two? One World Trade. All right. One? Yeah. Yeah, there's smoke. We got about 100 people up here. All right, we're on the way. Engine 1 out, World Trade Center, 1060. Send every available ambulance, everything you got to the World Trade Center now. Right oh, now. there's another one. Another plane just hit. <gasps> Right, oh, oh my God! Oh. Another plane has just hit. It hit another building. Oh. Flew right into the middle of it. Oh. Explosion. C3, a major collapse in one of the towers. Tower gate. Tower two. Tower two. The South Tower, major collapse. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now, raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. That was the day everything we knew was turned upside down. And it was the day that the FDNY suffered 343 line-of-duty deaths in one incident. Many more would take years to lose their battle with cancer caused by working in the rubble. Some are still fighting cancer today. 18 years later. Here to talk about the impact the terror attack on America had on the fire service is Rick Lasky. He's well known around the country for his seminars on pride and ownership. If you've not heard him speak live, you've missed an amazing presentation. You really should book him to speak at your next major event. I've heard him and I recommend him highly. Rick retired after being chief of several departments, including Louisville, Texas. He started his career 40 years earlier in Chicago, which is where I hail from myself. And Rick Lasky joins me now. Welcome back to Code 3. Hey, it's great to be here, Scott. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on again. It's an honor. Well, it's always good to talk with you. Today, of course, we want to talk about the events of September 11, 2001. I want to start with where you were when you heard about it. Well, I was a fire chief in Louisville, Texas, which is about 10 minutes north of Dallas there. Um, I was actually, I, I ran out to meet someone and was on my way back. I ran through one of these little, little coffee huts for a cup of coffee, and my next telephone started beeping off the off my belt, if you will, Got back to quarters and uh, went into the day room. The guys had the television on. They were watching it. And uh, as we've all seen over and over again, a few minutes later, we saw the second plane hit. And, 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 and Scott, while I'm sitting there, the first thing I'm thinking of is, you know, all my friends, who's on duty, who's not on duty. And then when that second plane hit was, 
it was just like everybody else. It was just an absolute shock on such a horrible, horrible day. You, like everyone else, may have assumed that the first one was some kind of horrific accident, but the second one was obviously intentional. Well, yeah, you know, the initial reports, you know, about it being a sightseeing plane, a media thing, or whatever, the, when they showed the hole in the side of the building, it, you know, I'm a little bit more suspicious than most people when I'm sitting there going, that's, it's, it's way too big for, for them to, you know, be talking about a smaller plane. Secondly, you know, those buildings are big, you know, 110 stories an acre in size, but boy, oh boy, you really, it's, it's hard to imagine it being an accident. And about that time, like you said, Scott, the second one hit, and we all knew at that point that it, it wasn't an accident. Now, you mentioned the fact that you do have a lot of friends in the FDNY. How long after it happened did you start to hear from them as to whether they were involved in what they knew about what was going on? Well, you know, throughout the day, you know, everybody was checking with everybody. The the circle of friends I run with through Fire Engineering Magazine and, and just in, in my teaching, uh, you know, rounds over the years. You know, you, you know, my, my best friend, my, the best friend I've ever had in my life is John Salka, and he was a battalion chief in the 18th Battalion in, in, in New York City. I started thinking of John. You know, I talked to Andy Fredericks. A lot of people know firefighter now, Lieutenant Andy Fredericks. I talked to him the day before. Andy actually went day, back a day early. He had been off with a knee injury, and he was coming down to Louisville to teach for, for our guys. And we were setting that up. We were talking on the phone, and he said, you know, I hated being away from the firehouse for all these months, you know, being hurt. He goes, I can't wait to get back. But the best thing about it is I got to go to Haley's first day at kindergarten, his daughter. We both have daddy's uh, girls. And, and as we all know, Andy was taken from us on that day. But just so many, so many great people, the talent. I mean, I, mean, I know we only have so much time, but when you think about all the people that we lost, just on the fire service side, on the EMS side, on law enforcement, then what happened in Shanksville, you know, with the plane that went down there and at the Pentagon, coincidentally, my, my good friend, Colonel Brian Birdwell, now Senator Birdwell from Granbury, Texas, the nose of that plane was a direct hit on his, his office, killed all his staff. They were in their meeting room, their conference room, watching everything unfold in New York City. He went up to go to the men's room on his way back. Uh, it hit the fireball, got him, burned him really bad, killed all his staff. Uh, Colonel Birdwell, Senator Birdwell now, um, after that, created Face the Fire Ministries out near Granbury, Texas, where servicemen and women who are burned, uh, injured bad, can go and hunt and fish and horseback ride without people pointing fingers and looking at him. He's, he's a great man, and I love him dearly. But watching everything unfold in New York City, I'll be honest, I didn't, I didn't hear, I didn't know my best buddy. I heard he was okay, and that was through people talking, you know, I think I saw him, all this till I heard some of the radio transmissions on the news at about 9.15 at night. And I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm a man's man, you know, but I broke down and cried. I remember sitting with my wife at the at the, having a late dinner and just taking everything in. You know, throughout the day, we kept hearing who was on duty, who wasn't on duty. And as you know, Scott, it was so hard because, you know, I shift changed. So many people who were supposed to be off duty jumped on the rigs and went down there as well. Guys who were off duty went down there as well. You know, so it was it was just hard keeping track of, of everybody and, and where they were. I know exactly what you're talking about. And in the intro to this interview, of course, we played that montage of all the radio traffic. And, and you know, when I was putting that together, it gave me chills even 18 years later. Well, I ended up down there uh, a few days later. You, you know, I, I, I went back and forth. I went from being just devastated and sad to be becoming angry Back to being sad, you know. I, I've always said I can't imagine. I always tell my best buddy John Salka. I said that that was that was your family. You're an FDNY battalion chief, you know. Uh, all those years in the job there, busiest companies. His his very good friend, one of his best friends, uh, Jay Jonas. Now you know deputy chief. I think he's a, a borough commander or or a, a acting borough commander in, in, in the seventh division in the Bronx. Jay was the captain on Ladder 6 that uh, everybody has heard about over the years. Uh, I think the one special is called in the History Channel, The Miracle of Stairwell B. They were bringing Josephine down. Jay and John went to the academy, the Pro the Proby School together. They carpooled. Jay is godfather for one of John's sons, uh, James, who's a, a, a currently a captain in the Marines. 
it, just talking with some of my friends, you know, not knowing, you know, assuming and thinking, well, they got to be gone after so after so long, you know, it's just, you know, you you, you kind of lose some hope. You're just hoping that they bring your friends home so their family can have closure. But uh, the emotion, you know, I just, like I said, I can't even imagine. I was, my heart was broken. I won't say my spirit. Uh, I will say this: if you're a firefighter, I've said this forever. If you're a fire, if you're a firefighter and you and you listen to those audio tapes then and you listen to them today, if if you don't if you don't feel proud in any way as to what you do after listening to our our our, our brothers in New York City, the calmness. I mean, you know, after the collapse, there's a little bit of you know higher pitched radio traffic, but the professionalism, the calmness, uh, the way they went about their business. Uh, there's very few fire departments, I think, in the world that could pull off what what they did at such a horrible moment with that tragedy. It's just it's just living proof of what they do from day one in the academy, their heritage, their tradition, what they produce. But uh, the, the the talent, you know, all, all those folks taken from their families, you know, it, it's been a while, but it just it seems like yesterday. Unfortunately, and Scott, you know, I've it's on my, my channel coins. One of the sayings I I kind of came up with after that uh, because everybody did the whole never forget thing right away. Never forget, never forget. And, you know, I've said for years, I've written about it and I've talked about it. Never forgetting means never forgetting. And, um, you know, for the longest time, Scott, you could go to, you know, FDIC in Indianapolis, any show uh, where there's exhibits and pretty much every piece of fire apparatus had a memorial decal on it, you know, something remembering those that were lost. And uh, now you're, you'd be hard pressed, uh, I know in Louisville they do it. I know in the colony, Texas, they do it. Um, there's still some holdouts that are with good bosses that are doing great things. But so many people just kind of, well, it was popular to put a sticker on my side of my rig back then and on my helmet. And, well, it's been a while now. And, and, and that's probably the most frustrating thing. It's not about wanting people to remain angry and upset. It's about never forgetting the talent that was stolen from us that day. Because I still believe they continue to to teach. They continue. To, Andy Fredericks is still teaching to us today, and so so many other people from there are Scott. Uh, so I, I think I wish more people would zoom in on the never forgetting means never forgetting. I'm glad they do the stair climbs. You know, I think some some of those have turned into more of a spectator sport, kind of like people that were getting pieces of uh, steel from the World Trade Center you know, holding parades and barbecues and celebrations. And I'm, uh, I'm like, I'm, I'm glad we have a piece of it, an artifact on display in Louisville, but, and, and it, there, there were some departments that did the right thing, Scott, and they, you know, did it very honorable. And so I'm going to turn it into a, I'll just say it, it was, it was a, kind of like a three ring circus. And, and that was sad to see, but I'll say, I'll, I will say this, the majority of departments did what was right, did the right thing and have a very nice, memorial that will be there forever to remember those we lost so long story short never forgetting means never forgetting right and i think that's important i saw a meme on facebook the other day for the first time that said you said you'd never forget have you yeah yeah i've seen that several times now and you know it's a couple years ago i was i was doing a talk and uh, i think i was interim chief and trophy club at the time in texas helping them get a new chief and um, one of the things I did a talk at the high school and I realized that was the first year we had freshmen in high school that weren't alive uh, for September 11, 2001. Um, so it, it is it is moving out there in years, but at the same time, it, it hasn't been that long. And, you know, I think the day we, we forget, the day we uh, we do an injustice to the, to the sacrifices made by by everybody. And, and I'm talking citizens. There were a lot of hero citizens that day, Scott. You know, the police officers, you know, law enforcement, EMS, um, so many people, you know, we forget about the fire patrolman, you know, that was taken from us that day at the World Trade Center, the dispatch, the dispatcher from Jersey City that responded over mutual aid, one of their chiefs. And, and there's so many stories of, of acts of bravery by people that weren't wearing a badge or wearing a helmet. Uh, so many great people taken from us. Uh, so it, it's it's more than just uh, just that he'll never forget. It really means not forgetting. True, but I do recall that series on TV a few years back called Rescue Me with Dennis Leary. Part of the backstory of that series was that they were a little frustrated that people, even in New York City, were they felt starting to forget about what had happened. 
And at one point, a character even said, well, it's been three years. You can't expect people to remember forever. Well, and that, and that and that that's that's sad in itself. And I and I I, I agree with you, buddy. I, I will say this for for those that watch the series Chicago Fire, our good friend Chief Steve Chikorotis, now retired uh, chief from Chicago, the technical advisor for that show, many other shows, movies. Steve is Steve is a true brother. He is a great great man, a great leader, a friend to so many so many people, a mentor. When they wrote the show for Chicago Fire a couple of years ago, and had my friend John Salka come on play himself about the battalion chief from Chicago going back to New York City, uh, I, I will say this: you need to watch that to your to your listeners. You need to watch that episode. Listen to what that chief says the moment he starts describing what happened. He takes you from the Chicago firehouse to them getting out of the cab in, in front of 10 and 10's house in New York and at the base of uh, the Freedom Tower at the you know the World Trade Center site. And then you see my, our friend John Salka come out and greet him. When you hear him explain to, about how he, you know, how you're supposed to feel when he sees the little kids running around by the fountains, by the memorial fountains, uh, I'll tell you, Steve Chikorotis and their, their, their writers did an incredible job, Scott, really explaining for, for, for you know, how you should feel. Uh, a lot of people were frustrated. A lot of people, especially firefighters, we're used to saving people or doing everything we can. And when you get there and after a while, there's nothing you could do. You feel almost like you failed them. And that's what he had to overcome. It's just an incredible, I know it's a TV show, but what an incredible way to explain how you should feel. And I, I think a lot of people, Scott, have struggled with, okay, should I be angry? Should I be sad? Should I just... You know, once in a while, I think you need to take time to celebrate the lives of those who were lost. We did a show on fire engineering, and we had Chief Jay Jonas, I mentioned Jay, come on the show, and, and Captain Mike Dugan, another great, great guy. And we, we talked about those we lost. We didn't go back to that day, per se, and talk about Mike working. You know, Mike's the one that hung that the flag up over on the light stand that you saw in Reader's Digest. You know, Jay obviously being rescued after the collapse, you know, the miracle stairwell B. Scott, we were we were able to sit down and talk about those we lost and celebrate their lives and shared some stories about Andy, Billy McGinn. Lieutenant Billy McGinn was lieutenant of Squad 18, who was the one on the radio that, that said that, not exactly word for word, but some of the lines, that plane was flown deliberately into that building. We need to be thinking terrorism. Billy was one of our instructors at FDIC, a uh, good friend of John Salka's again. We, I told a little story about him. That's that's it's a funny story. So we we shared some stories about uh, the incredible people that were taken from us that day, and some some teaching moments, some uh, some funny moments about them. And you know, it's it's easy to get sad on September 11th, the days leading up to and after. But once in a while, I think we need to spend time talking about those people and just how great they were and what they meant to us. What do you think of the tourists who go out there and shoot smiling selfies and uh, with the memorial in the background? You know, I, I struggle with that, like a lot of people. Um, you know, I have, I have, a, I have a, you know, I've, I've been a big fan of on the fire scene when, when your guys and gals make a good stop, make a grab, make a rescue. You know, when nobody's around, you kind of get them together, you take a picture of the moment celebrating, you know, their victory at that fire scene. I take issue with some of the people. Uh, it, it's, you know, I think some of it is an accident. I think some people want to record the moment. Uh, they're standing in front of the memorial or they're standing somewhere there. And, you know, they smile because most people do that. Most people smile when you take pictures of them. Uh, so I think some of it's by accident. I think some of them that are taken, I, I think, and I think these are probably – the few um, don't exercise that good judgment. And those are the people I really wish wouldn't do it. But I think a lot of it, Scott, a lot of the selfies are people recording the moment. Here I am at the World Trade Center, at the memorial, at the at the fountains, get ready to go into the to the uh, the memorial, the museum. Um, and, you know, I, I, just, I think it's just a natural, you know, it's, it's, you know, you know, what I'm saying, Scott, sometimes it's just you know, people are so I, very few people take a picture of them, you know, of themselves or with people where they don't smile. It's, it's just sort of a reflex. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but I, but you're right on some. You know, I guess some of them are totally uncalled for and they're they're in very poor taste. 
But I think the majority of them are people are trying to record the moment. And uh, it's like it's like people that go out to Pearl Harbor and stand on top of the Arizona, you know, go to, you know, Normandy Beach or whatever. You know, they, they record the moment. I think most of the people that go there go there with a, a full heart and don't mean to be uh, disrespectful. It's the ones. And the other ones, Scott, you know, they, they, they do that stuff everywhere. They, 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 you know, they're the ones that will pull up at an accident scene and make jokes about the people that are hurt or the cars or, you know, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I, I really think those are the few. I think most of the people, like you said, it's a reflex thing. They take a smile and it's like, well, too late. I already smiled. I, 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 I'm mixed on it, but I think most of the people really don't mean it on purpose, you know, to be disrespectful. Now, have you been out to the memorial since it became an official memorial? Yes. I took my wife and my daughter, and uh, my son was actually uh, uh, in the service in Afghanistan at the time. He uh, was an FMF corpsman, a Fleet Marine Force corpsman that, with the Navy attached to the Marines, and he couldn't go with us. But And uh, I went, we went, my, my, my buddy John Salka went with us, and, you know, I'll say this, I went, um, I, I I don't know if I'll go back only because it made me very, very sad, but but it was done very tastefully. I think if you go to New York City, you need you need to you need to visit the site. You need to visit the fountains. You need to visit the museum, if you will, and, and pay your respects. Very, very professionally, very, very tastefully, respectfully, very honorable what they did and how they did it. I will admit I've not been there yet. However, I'd imagine it's similar to something I experienced when, you know, I used to do TV news. I went to the Oklahoma City site when they still had the fence up with T-shirts on it. Happened to run into three, four, I guess it was, Secret Service agents who were all there for an event, and they went over to see the, the fence and look at the shirts. All four of them looked at them, looked at the bombing site, then they all turned away from each other, and I wondered what that was, and I realized they were all tearing up and didn't want each other to see it. Is that the yeah. kind of reaction you had? Yeah, you know, yes. I, I'm <laughs> I'm a, a, a time bomb of tears when it comes to some <laughs> things as it is, but you know, I had been down there pretty quick, and my good friend uh, uh, Don Hayde just retired from the rescue battalion, battalion chief. I think at the time he retired, he was the most tenured FDNY firefighter. Uh, a Marine, a great, great guy. We taught together for years, for decades. He, um, he, John Norman from New York City, who took over, took the reins for Chief Ray Downey, another one of my mentors that was taken from us that day. Sal Marchese from New York. He was uh, at the time I signed a 142 truck in Queens. Um, I met Donnie, and uh, he was in the rescue battalion, and we went down there. And, and I remember standing with him and looking, and I, I just stood there, you know, with tears in my eyes, but I, I stood there, look, I couldn't put it together. And I had been down there, I can't tell you how many times. Uh, I can't tell how many times I've spent riding out in New York City with my friends in the, with the fire department. I couldn't put it together. And he asked me, he goes, he goes, have you put it together yet? And I said, no. And then he started pointing out landmarks and I was able to to start to put things together. But it, it just was, it was incredible to see that. Not too long after that, uh, we were down there uh, my wife, my daughter, we, uh, and uh, John uh, Salka took us to the top of Ten and Ten's house when they used to, would allow you up there. They, right after that, they had a piece of the Deutsch building next door fall off and actually fall through the stairwell. So they said no, no longer people up on the roof. But we went up there. We were able to look at the site. You know, my wife's a minister's daughter, so you know, obviously with some prayers, and then see them as they started to, uh, you know, to to finish things off down. You know, looking down in there. And again, it's a very emotional place. Again, uh, loss of words sometimes when it comes to describing the feelings, but so many great people taken from us that day. Yeah, there were. And I think as much as we're sad that they're gone, we're proud of what they tried to accomplish. And in a lot of cases, what they did accomplish. These are the people that the media likes to say run toward disasters when everyone else is running away. And we can be proud of the brothers who did that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, Jay Jonas did a newsletter on uh, Captain Patty Brown. I will say it, uh, he would never consider himself a legend. He's the, a modest, modest person, but what a great man that was taken from us that day. Patty Brown, uh, if you listen to radio traffic, I don't think you'll ever, I don't think you heard it before and you'll never hear it again. Being ordered out of building, I think by Chief Hayden, who had taken over command, Pete Hayden, 
He's calling him on the radio, ladder three, you know, evacuate the building, trying to get him on the radio. And I think he finally said, you know, command post to ladder three, Captain Patty Brown, you know, evacuate the building immediately. And and Patty Brown came back on the radio and said, ladder three to command post, I'm respectfully refusing that order. I have too many injured civilians. This is a Vietnam vet. This is a, a unbelievably decorated Vietnam vet and FDNY firefighter. And uh, like you said, they went in. I don't think a lot of people knew. A lot of people like to say they did now. I don't think a lot of people knew those buildings were going to come down like they did. But, you know, no hesitation, whether you're waiting for orders or you went up with other crews. Uh, you know, you, you had a lot of things going on. Just the the site is a 16-acre site. Forgetting all the buildings around it that were damaged, you know, before the collapse and after the collapse. And then the building, you know, the other, the 40-story that collapsed later on. You're right. To see them going in, that goes back, Scott, to what I said. Listen to the radio traffic. You know, I, I, some places they, they scream over a dumpster fire, um, a trash <laughs> can fire. Ever. Yeah. yeah, but but these these guys are seasoned. I mean, to them, it was going to work and doing the job. It wasn't time to panic. Exactly. It was time to go to work. And that's why there was no hesitation. There was no well, what do you think? You know, uh, we talk about, you know, a firefighters being aggressive. I think we're blessed if firefighters are aggressive. Talk for another day. It's an article I did, you know, are we too aggressive or just using the wrong word? We get ourselves hurt when we become reckless. But I thank God every day firefighters are aggressive enough to go in after that kid, go after that grandma, go in after another firefighter, run into those two towers like they did on that day. You know, that just... It, 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 I think it defines what the fire service represents. So I said, if you're not proud of those people, proud of, of that moment, of of the sacrifices, as horrible as that is, and I know that sounds goofy, to to know what 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 they represented for all of us as firefighters, what what we stand for, absolutely incredible. What 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 they demonstrated that day, and and I don't even I don't, I don't even think you can say acts of bravery is is even appropriate. That goes well beyond that. That's true, and we'll leave it there. Some great memories of what you saw and what you experienced, Chief. Thanks for being with me today on Code 3. Scott, thank you. Like I said, it's always an honor, buddy, when, when you when you invite um, I me. Mean, I'll do it anytime. Uh, you're a great guy. You're, you're making a huge difference in the fire service, and I can't thank you enough for that, buddy. Thanks for what you do. And we put more information about the September 11th attacks on our website at Code3Podcast.com slash terrorism. Check it out. All right, that's it. That's all for this edition of Code 3. Thank you for listening. I'll be back next time with more, and I hope you'll join me then. I'm Scott Orr, and until then, stay safe. Code 3 is a production of Enchanted Sky Media. To contact us, get more information on today's topic, or to subscribe to the podcast, go to Code3Podcast.com.